to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. For several years since I've been in this country, I've experienced a strange syndrome whenever I've eaten out of a Chinese restaurant. Numbness in the back of the neck, gradually radiating to both arms in the back, general weakness and palpitation. Some of my colleagues speculated that it might be caused by some ingredient in the soy sauce, while others have suggested it may be caused by monosodium glutamate. This letter in 1968 by Dr. Robert Homan Quok marked the beginning of bad science, racism, and fear mongering around one food item that actually turned out to be a hoax. Hi, my name is Pranav. You're watching Science is Dope, and this is a story of MSG. Not this guy, but monosodium glutamate, aka Ajinomoto, and how this common food seasoning became feared by millions across the world and also got our beloved Maggie banned for a while. Let's put that up. Growing up, my parents would always say stuff like, don't have too much Chinese food. They add Ajinomoto and that's bad for you. I'm sure some of you watching would have had similar experiences. Even in school, I've heard teachers say that it's a dangerous adulterant added to food. Basically, I feared Ajinomoto or MSG. That was until a man in an orange polo t-shirt appeared in my YouTube recommendations and opened my eyes. It's Uncle Roger's favorite thing. MSG? Purity greater than 99% so pure. If you haven't watched Uncle Roger, I highly recommend you do. He reviews cooking videos, a genre you thought couldn't possibly be funny, but he makes it hilarious. Anyway, since he swears by MSG, I thought, what if I'm missing on some great flavor because of some urban myth? I must find out the truth. But what I found out was a bit more messed up than I expected it to be. But before we get into that, I know you guys want to know how Maggie fits in this story. The year was 2014, a Food Safety and Drug Administration officer spotted the no added MSG label on Maggie packets sold in the market. To see if this claim was true, he collected a few Maggie packets and got them tested. And the results were not in favor of Maggie. Not only did the noodles have MSG, it also had very high levels of lead. 17.2 parts per million. The very next year, in 2015, the government banned the sale of Maggie due to unsafe levels of lead. Now, the reason for the ban was legitimate because lead is toxic to humans. But this whole fiasco began because of three words, no added MSG. Why did Nestle feel the need to add this label in the first place? Not just Maggie, but many food brands and even food delivery apps promote no MSG food as a better alternative. Let's figure out why. The year was 1908. Kikunai Ikeda, a Japanese chemist, was enjoying a bowl of soup his wife had made for dinner. Something about the taste of the soup didn't add up. So he asked his wife, is there any meat in the soup? And his wife replied, no. Why would there be any meat in vegetable and tofu soup? Then where was this savory and meaty flavor coming from? And his wife said it's because she uses kombu. That's a Japanese term meaning dried seaweed. The moment he heard this, the chemist in him couldn't wait to find out what was actually behind this unique flavor. He buried some seaweed soup and went to his lab. There he distilled the soup removed the impurities and ended up with a white crystalline solid. Upon testing, he discovered that the crystals were of glutamic acid. He tasted them to confirm and was hit by this flavor bomb of savory meaty taste. Dr. Ikeda realized that just like the purest form of sweetness was sugar and saltiness was salt, he had in front of him the purest form of what he called the glutamic taste. He wanted to make an easy to use water soluble form of this that could be added to food as a seasoning. He thought common salt or sodium chloride is easily soluble in water. So why not make the sodium salt of 
glutamic acid. He then carried out a simple neutralization reaction where he took glutamic acid and sodium hydroxide, which is a base, to get the salt monosodium glutamate. And like he predicted, the sodium salt was easily soluble in water and uh, also had a much better glutamic taste than glutamic acid. And that is how MSG was born. Now you heard me say the word acid a couple of times and you might be freaking out thinking, oh my God, acid sounds dangerous. Wait, hear me out. What if I told you that almost 16% of your body was made up of acids? Every organ in our body, our muscles, skin, hair, bones, even our DNA in our cells, they're made of proteins. And what makes these proteins? Tiny building blocks of life called amino acids. Not only as humans, every living thing on this planet is made up of amino acids. Basically, life on Earth wouldn't have existed if it weren't for amino acids. And you know what else is an amino acid? Glutamic acid. It's essential for the body to function properly. In fact, it's so essential that our body makes glutamate on its own. Without it, our nerve cells wouldn't be able to talk to each other effectively. Now, glutamate is also found in plants and it plays an important role in plant growth, uh, seed germination and resistance against pathogens. Now, if we could somehow extract glutamate from plants and add sodium to it, we would have MSG. And this is exactly what Dr. Ikeda did. The very next year, he started a company to manufacture MSG on a large scale. And the name of that company you'll probably be familiar with already because the name has become synonymous with MSG, at least in India. Any guesses? Ajinomoto. As soon as they released the product to the Japanese market in 1909, it became an instant hit. Over the next few decades, MSG spread across the globe. Makers of chips, canned soups, ketchup, and instant noodles started adding it as a flavor enhancer to make their products even more irresistible. And they were pretty successful at it. But why do we find the taste of MSG so irresistible? MSG is the purest form of this glutamic taste or umami. Not unagi, umami. It comes from Japanese and literally means essence of deliciousness. Umami is the taste you get when you eat a cheese loaded pizza or some fried mushrooms or some sizzling grilled fish. If you love these foods, then let me tell you your craving for umami has an evolutionary reason behind it. Back when we were foragers and did not have the generational knowledge of what is food and what isn't, we relied on our tongue to tell us that. We have evolved taste receptors whose primary function is to tell us if something is edible or not. If something tastes good like sweet fruits and berries, a brain is telling us that gives you energy, have more of it. And if something tastes bad like sand or wood, that's our brain telling us don't eat it. Things tasting bitter is an acute warning from the brain saying, hey, this could be toxic, get away from it. There are plants like bitter god, coffee, cocoa, etc. which have evolved to taste bitter to make animals think they're toxic protects them from being eaten, but many of them are actually good for you in moderation. The same way ice cream tastes good, but having too much of it isn't good for you, right? Basically, don't taste test things to see what's good or not. That doesn't always work. But when things taste good, you can always give this evolutionary explanation. Now, coming back to umami, why do we love umami? Because it's the taste of protein. Just like our brain likes sugar because it's the taste of high calorie foods, it also likes the taste of umami because it's an indicator that that food is high in protein or amino acids which our body needs. And since MSG is the purest form of umami that you can get, adding it to food fulfills this craving. It helps our tongue salivate more and enhances all the other flavors like any other seasoning. All right, so I've told you that MSG is something found naturally and we've evolved to like the taste of it. So why were some people afraid of it? Here's the thing, people weren't always afraid of it. Everything was going well for MSG until that letter from Robert Home and Quark reached the New England Journal of Medicine. 
After the letter from Dr. Koch, responses from readers across the US started flooding in saying they were victims of this Chinese restaurant syndrome. Many people wrote in complaining that they suffered from severe headaches, stomach issues, uh, allergic reactions, heart palpitations after eating at a Chinese restaurant. Newspapers and media cashed in on public fear with titles like Chinese food makes you crazy, MSG is number one suspect and in sensitive images like these. Thus began the anti-MSG movement. And the scientific community did not improve the situation either. For five years, her son Jeremy was angry and aggressive toward his schoolmates and family. Jeremy's family took him to Dr. Schwartz, who told them to remove all MSG from his diet. Critics of MSG used flawed studies to blame it for problems ranging from obesity to cancer. How flawed were those studies? We'll get to all that in a minute. But once mass media became commonplace, this fear of MSG reached our homes. And even after decades, this fear still exists. But do you know the most ridiculous fact about all this? Dr. Homan Kwok, who started all this, may not even have been a real person. There are two stories that throw a pretty suspicious light on him. The first version of the story seems pretty straightforward. Dr. Homan Kwok was a senior research investigator and pediatrician in Maryland. He was a man of Cantonese descent who migrated to the US from China a couple of years back. But here are a couple of red flags why I can't completely agree with this version. This letter was written in 1968. MSG was being used for decades in Chinese food before that, even before it became popular in the US. So why was he experiencing symptoms only in Chinese restaurants in the US? But what struck me as odd was that he ends his letter by saying that he's willing to participate in scientific research to look into this rather unknown syndrome. So I did a Google Scholar search uh, for papers on MSG published between 1968 and 99 and I couldn't find his name as the author on any of the papers. His name was only mentioned in reference to this letter. Doesn't seem right, does it? Almost 50 years after the MSG fiasco, a new story came to light. In January 2018, Jennifer Lemassurier, a professor at Colgate University who was the main author on a paper on MSG, received a very strange voicemail. The person introduced himself as Dr. Howard Steele and said that he wrote that initial letter as Dr. Ho Man Kwok. This left the professor confused because she expected Dr. Kok to be a man of Chinese descent. And more importantly, Dr. Kok had passed away in 2014. She came across his obituary when researching for her paper on MSG. So who was this man and why did he leave her a message claiming to be Dr. Robert Ho Man Kok? She quickly set up a meeting with Dr. Howard Steele who told her that the MSG letter was a result of a bet he had with a friend. Back in the 1960s, Dr. Steele was a practicing orthopedic surgeon from Philadelphia. One night, Dr. Steele and his friend Dr. Bill were having a meal at a Chinese restaurant, having a casual conversation. And Dr. Bill bet him $10 that uh, no orthopedic surgeon could get published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Steele took this bet. Now, after overeating and having a couple of drinks, he was feeling a little sick, so he went back home. And then an idea struck him. What if I write a silly article describing my symptoms and send it to the NEJM, but make it so obvious that they'll know immediately that it's fake? He chose the name Ho Man Coke because it sounds like human troc, which is what you'd call someone who's being a jerk, a human troc of sh**. But as a side note, a quick Google search will tell you that uh, Coke happens to be a rather popular surname among Cantonese speaking people and isn't a random made up name. He also named it the Chinese restaurant syndrome uh, because he thought that uh, you know naming it something so insensitive would prompt the journal into running some background checks before publishing, but that didn't happen. His letter got published, a lot of responses followed, the media frenzy happened, and MSG went from being a sought after seasoning to something controversial. He also mentions that he called the 
editor of the Any James back then, explaining that the letter was a big fat lie. He never got any responses from the journal. So now he was left with two losses in a sense. One, he unwantedly gave birth to a medical myth and two, his friend didn't even pay him the $10. Even though the story sounds very fascinating, there's no way of proving any of this is true. Because as of today, Dr. Steele or anyone who was working with the magazine back then aren't alive to tell us exactly how the events went down. But the main villain in this entire story isn't Dr. Steele or Dr. Cook. It's the people in authority, the people of the journal who published that letter titled Chinese Restaurant Syndrome without, you know, having any studies to back the claims. And if we consider Dr. Steele's narrative to be the real one, he, they didn't even rectify themselves after multiple approaches by him. They just let the world blame an ingredient that came from another part of the world. But what about the people who wrote in saying they were experiencing symptoms? And what about the multiple studies on MSG that came out after this? Uh, the studies that showed MSG was bad. Surely not all these people were in on the joke. Also, MSG is an ingredient in many packaged foods like chips, sauces, fried chicken. In fact, American processed food has more MSG than Chinese food. But people complain about Chinese restaurant syndrome. They don't complain about Kentucky fried chicken syndrome. So why the double standards? Why does MSG in Chinese food get treated one way, but American food doesn't get the same treatment? Let's dig a little deeper into this. While most of us expect the scientific community to be fair and without any bias, unfortunately that isn't the case. Science and racism have a very old and dark history. For ages, people have used science as a, an excuse to justify their racist treatments of certain groups. One famous example is a study that came out in 1988, a study by psychologist Dr. J.P. Rushton linking IQ and race. There were studies that gave rise to the eugenics movement in the US. Eugenics is basically the science or I should say the pseudoscience of planned breeding of people based on some genetic, some made up genetic superiority. The authors of such studies let their own racist biases creep into their research. The conclusions of such studies uh, showed one people as one group of people as superior and another group as inferior. And most of the research that propagated fear of MSD are no different. Right after the publication in the NEJM, MSG in Chinese restaurant syndrome became a hot topic among researchers. And they didn't waste a minute and started looking to the effects of MSD, but through a racist lens. Since the popular opinion on MSD was that it was bad, uh, many studies were designed in such a way that uh, the conclusions would prove that MSD was bad to match with the public opinion. One such research was this, where participants were injected with 25 to 125 milligrams of MSG. And they began showing symptoms of CRS and reported a burning sensation. Well, no shit, Sherlock. Anything can cause symptoms when given in a high enough dose. I'm sure if someone injected that much table salt into my veins, I'd show symptoms. Even a standard saline drip causes a mild burning sensation. Another MSD study Scientists gave hamsters an oral dose of 8 mg per gram of MSG and showed that it destroyed the nerve cells of the retina. Again, the dose given was extremely high. Like if you convert it to human equivalents, it's something like half a kilo. Who is eating half a kilo of MSG in one sitting? If we look at the recipes that use MSG, they recommend uh, something between half a tablespoon of MSG for a two person meal, which is about two grams per person. Also the sample size of that first study was six and they weren't blinded, meaning they knew that what they were eating. This kind of flawed test should not be used to conclude anything. Unfortunately, there were many papers like this that followed similar research tactics to prove the popular opinion that is 
that MSG was bad. Now, a double blind crossover study got published the very next year. It showed that CRS can be self induced by suggestion, meaning that your brain told you that by eating this, you will get symptoms. In their study, they divided the participants into two groups, and one group was given beef broth with MSG, and the other group without. MSG but apparently both the groups showed symptoms of CRS and uh, there were many among in the group that was given MSG who showed no symptoms of CRS. Throughout this entire flood of research that came out the name Chinese restaurant syndrome was the center of attraction. Some researchers tried to change the name to MSG atrophy but that wouldn't be very newsworthy. It. So if we leave the xenophobic media coverage and the bad scientific studies aside, is there any real reason to fear MSG? If something is good or bad for us, it depends on how much of it we eat. Take water. Drinking 3-4 to four liters of water a day is excellent because every cell in your body needs water. But drinking 3-4 to four liters of water every 2 hours can cause what's known as water poison. Too much water can dilute sodium and other electrolytes in the body leading to problems like nausea, confusion etc. Similarly, MSD which is a seasoning like salt and pepper when consumed within reasonable limits is perfectly fine. Recent studies could not find any link between consuming small amounts of MSD as a flavoring agent and symptoms like headaches and palpitation. Various papers have reviewed the 40 years of research uh, that has gone into MSD since 1968 and they found that many of the earlier studies that sensationalized this Chinese restaurant syndrome, they were all either poorly structured, many of them were uh, not blinded or controlled and many of them were not reproducible. Does all this mean MSG is safe? Yes, according to international organizations like the FDA, which recognizes MSG as generally safe to eat. And in India, there's the FSSAI, which allows the addition of MSG to food, but within reasonable limits. Moderation is the key here. Treat MSG as a seasoning you add to food to make it taste better. So that's it. Don't shy away from adding a little bit of Ajinomoto when having some soup or fried rice next time. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.